I love to hear testimonies. And once in a while, I get to hear your testimonies. A testimony is a story of how God has worked in somebody's life uh, the, the before they met Christ, the how they met Christ, and what it's been like since they've met Christ. And, and so testimonies are an awesome thing. We love to hear those testimonies that glorify God in huge ways, like um, some famous sports player who... Uh, here's the gospel, gets saved, and his life is transformed, and he's a witness on the field. Or we hear of some movie star who comes to know Jesus, and they proclaim it in Hollywood and get canceled, you know. Uh, those kinds of those kinds of testimonies are awesome, you know. And we all have our own testimony of what God is doing or has done in our lives, Um you know, I got saved when I was 15, and I thought I was a pretty cool kid. And so that during those years, I know I told you before, Marianne uh, and I met in the sixth grade, and she was a military brat. So during our ninth grade year, she was in San Diego. And uh, that's when I became a Christian, when she was gone. I'm amazing. But <laughs> all the way down in San Diego, she heard that Dale King became a Christian and everybody knew, you know, this, this punk kid accepted Christ. And so the testimony was known. We all have our testimony. And though we hear these testimonies of horribly lost sinners transform into unexpected saints, we love to hear the gnarly parts. And because... It's through that we understand God's grace and he's glorified through it. We're floored by God's amazing grace. And so all of us have our unique salvation story with distinctive circumstances, but some of us feel like our testimonies are boring. How many of you guys feel like your testimony's boring out there? Okay, you know, I've heard it. I've heard it before. Yeah, I grew up in a Christian home. I don't really remember when I became a Christian, but I am a Christian. And, um, but even if you say you've been a Christian for as long as you could remember, we all have the same spiritual testimony. Each and every one of us. I mean, guys like Paul that was persecuting the church and, and put to death Christians, but then came to Christ. You have the same testimony spiritually as Paul. And of these amazing testimonies we've heard over the years, it's both gnarly and glorious. And so God's work in your life is no less amazing. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise, not even yourself. Scripture reveals in the passage we're looking at today, your real testimony seen from the eyes of heaven. It's your testimony on the cosmic scale. And so if you have been discouraged by not having a, a crazy, gnarly story, here it is. We can all recite this as our own testimony. And it begins in verse 1 through 3, where we find that we were once hopelessly lost. We were once hopeless, hopelessly lost. Now, believe it or not, this is the third sentence in the book of Ephesians. But it is another long sentence. Verses 1 through 10 is one sentence. So chapter 2, sentence 3 for 10 verses. The theme in this sentence is the riches of his grace lavished upon us. And so we must first come to grips and understand our own depravity and our absolute need for salvation. And so in verse 1, it begins... And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. It's important to never forget where you came from and where you were headed. I mean, the Bible tells us for the wages of sin is death. And the payment of sin is eternal hell. When we were dead, it means that we lacked a spiritual life. It means we were completely indifferent toward the things of God. Spiritually, we were deceased. 
Spiritual death is a real death. It's not one that we often recognize because we're always concerned about the physical and physical death, but spiritual death is real. And in fact, it's the most grave type of death you can experience. It has to do with the most important part of who you are. We're born as sinners. Scripture reveals that we're born into a depraved race, into a sinful line of spiritual death that proceeded from Adam, the father of all humanity. And in Genesis 2, verse 16, it says this, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, when you read the story, Adam doesn't take a bite and fall down dead. And so he surely does die eventually, but the spiritual death is immediate. As soon as he takes a bite, death entered the world at that moment. There was only one command to keep, and that was to not eat of a tree. But there was a, another command that to eat of every tree, be fruitful and multiply. I mean, there was so much more Adam could have been doing than worrying about this one fruit that he wasn't allowed to eat. But isn't that the story of a lot of us? His spiritual death was immediate. Actually, the, the, the phrase, you shall surely die, literally is this. Dying, you will die. Dying, you will die. And so he did die uh, spiritually immediately, but he would die over a period of years. And so we are born and we grow and then we are dying as well. Some of you guys feel it every day. <laughs> I felt it, you know, when I had to get up this morning. Oh my goodness. I don't want to go to church today. <laughs> yeah. But you're the pastor, you know, you know, that how, that's how it goes. Serve at church, it'll always get you here, right? Adam's physical death was delayed and prolonged, and so is ours. And um, his progeny was born into this fallen state. We are spiritually stillborn. Spiritually stillborn. Separated from God. Unable to respond to spiritual stimuli. You know, if the angels hooked you up to the spiritual sensors and they'd be like, there is no heartbeat, no stimulus, you know, hitting your reflexes with a spiritual hammer or something. Nothing happening here. Unresponsive to God, no desire for God. A complete inability to live for God or please God. We were helpless. We were hopeless. And Romans 3 tells us exactly how not only we, but all of humanity are with regards to sin. It says, it is written, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is your story. This is the condition of your heart from the time that you were born. There are two evils that characterize spiritual death. The first is trespasses and the second is sin. I love how John Stott says this, before God, we are both rebels and failures. Rebels and failures. And that pretty much summarizes what trespasses and sins are. To trespass is to willingly violate God's holy commandments. It's to step over the line, to overstep God's moral boundaries. And so we are rebels in transgression but we are also failures with regards to sin. Sin is literally missing the mark. 
um, it was used in the term of archery. And it's when somebody takes a shot and misses the bullseye. This for us is an involuntary action because we are sinners to miss the mark of God's perfect standard. None of us measure up. We offend God in the way we think, in the way we feel or talk or live. And so we were both transgressors and sinners. And David reflects on this in Psalm 51. He says, for I know my transgressions and my sins are ever before me. Against you, and he's praying to God, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, babies are born with a sinful nature, and if you've never had a, a child of your own, you might be thinking, man, that's, that's horrible to say. Babies are so cute, and they're so sweet. And then you have one, and you realize... Yes, they are cute and sweet, and you would do every, anything for them. You would die for them, but their attitudes. Have you ever noticed how soon it starts? How a little child can get angry. <laughs> how a little child could throw a fit, you know, and you're like, man, you're, you're just in diapers, you can't even stand up yet and you've learned how to sin already? You know, this is crazy. They haven't had many opportunities to sin, but it's coming. Just wait. But you see glimmers of the sinful nature in there. And there's, and there's no different with you. When your parents realized, oh my goodness, what did we give birth to? <laughs> Well, it says here, in which you once walked, this was our past behavior and conduct, whether it was in full bloom or just the beginnings when we came to know Christ. And some of us have a longer story of the gnarly parts of our life, but understand that sin is the disease and everybody has, it, and it leads to death. But there are symptoms of the disease and some symptoms are very evident while others aren't well developed yet. And so that's sometimes we, we see it the wrong way. We think the, the symptoms are the disease and we try to treat the symptoms, but the, the disease goes far deeper into the heart. But for those who do have a gnarly past, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, um, the, the Corinthians had a gnarly past. And, and Paul says this to them, they had become Christians, and he said, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, the, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And you, you might hear that list and say, Oh, how horrible. Man, they, yeah, those people, they shouldn't be in heaven. But notice what he says. And such were some of you. <laughs> You're among the worst. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And so though that be our past, we no longer live that way. But it's the way we used to walk. Now we look at more of what our pre meeting Christ's life was like. It, it says this, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. There are three evil influences on unbelievers here in what we just read. The first is the world, the second is Satan, and the third is our flesh. And so let's look at this it, with regards to your personal testimony. Um, you used to be under the evil influence of the world, following the course of this world. 
Have you ever heard the word zeitgeist? Zeitgeist? Uh, it's a German word that means spirit of the age. It refers to like the feelings, the mindsets, the attitudes, the characteristics at a specific time in history among a specific group of people. And so we could look at the United States and say there is a zeitgeist here, a spirit of the age that we may be able to sit down and, and define what it is. And you're probably more familiar with it than we can spend time defining it right now. But that's what this word course following the course of the world, the, the word course in Greek, aeon, means a particular stage of history understood according to its values, beliefs, and morals in distinction to God's. Here it refers to the mindset, customs, and practices of those who are estranged from God. And so we have grown up in the course of this world where we hear about it all the time. On social media, we, we watch it in movies. The spirit of the age is, is very active and you may feel very out of place once you've come to meet Christ, but before you met Christ, you were very much a part of it. And so understand when you're looking out at the world and you're saying, how could people think this way? <laughs> we've become judges who used to do the same thing. So instead we have compassion and we, we pray for people. Um, but at the same time, we realize that that's what we used to be. Do you li still live by the standards of the world? If that's true of you, then I want to ask a question before we're done today. And that is, have you truly accepted Christ? Have you truly been saved? Because one of the things that will happen is you will be freed from following the evil influence of the world. The world zeitgeist will be like, it'll be sick in your mind. You'll, you'll think about it and go, man, that's horrible. I don't want that anymore. And so God will transform your mind and your life and everything. But also it says, the second thing we see was the evil influence of Satan in our lives. It says here, following the prince of the power of the air. Now, ancients believed that the air between heaven and earth was where evil spirits lived. You can see it in Ephesians 6.12, where it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against this, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so Paul speaks of the heavenly places, at least the lower parts of the heavenly places being filled with evil spirits. Satan being the prince of the power of the air. Maybe, you know, today we can understand how the ancients believed that as people are documenting more and more weird things happen in the skies, you know, things we can't explain and things that don't match up with science. And, you know, I don't want to get into all that today, but Dare I say, yeah, it's the, the spiritual forces of evil, the prince of the power of the air. It's been there from the beginning of time. The prince of the power of the air is one of the unique titles for the devil, for Satan. And the reason why it's said this way is because it speaks of its authority as ruler over the fallen angelic beings. He's in charge of them. Um, but he's also in charge of or rules the sinful world below. So the prince of the power of the air. We used to be under his authority. We used to be captured and slaves to his kingdom. We used to be enemies of God, rebelling against him and fighting on the wrong side. We once loved the kingdom of darkness. We once hated the kingdom of light, but that has changed. So understand, and even before you met Christ, maybe you did experience spiritual things that were dark, um, spiritual forces. Maybe you got involved in the occult and so on. 
But later, shortly, we're going to talk about how God has freed you from all of that. But the spirit, uh, the, the prince of the power of the air is also called the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And, and so though we were once captive under Satan's power and influence, that has changed. But the, 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 the folks that have not yet come to Christ are still under his influence. He's at work in their lives spiritually. And 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 reveals one of the ways how Satan is working in the lives of unbelievers. It says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so Satan is a horrible taskmaster, slave driver, ruler of darkness, and he not only works to blind eyes, but he works to cause people to be disobedient. Again, a a word that's interesting to look at is this word disobedience. It literally means without being persuaded. It's stronger than the Greek synonym unbelief. It's the willingness or I'm sorry, the unwillingness to submit to God. It's a willful opposition to the gracious word and purpose of God. And so just think of that rebellious spirit of the age. You're not going to tell me what to do. Don't tell me what the Bible says. You know, that spirit of disobedience comes from the spirit that is at work in the lives of unbelievers. And so the question for us also is today, do you still wear the other team's uniform? Uh, If you've come to Christ, you've changed uniforms. You're on a different team. You're on a different side. No longer in rebellion to God, but rather um, he is your Lord, not the prince of the power of the air. Well, the last thing we see, the third thing is the evil influence of the flesh. If it wasn't hard enough because we have the world's messing with us and and Satan messing with us, our own flesh desires things that are contrary to God. Um, It says, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. We have cravings that are given to us by God, like to eat and to drink water and, and to have companionship and to receive affirmation. These are all um, things that God has given us, good desires, but sin perverts those desires. And we turn it into something, uh, what, what was meant to be a blessing turns into a curse. The way we seek affirmation, the way we try to feed ourselves or whatever it is. The flesh is that fallen part of who we are. It, the, the word flesh is understood to be the seed of sin and rebellion. It's that sinful nature. And so if you've ever felt that inside, that selfishness welling up, that desire to gratify your perverted needs, or that self-centered human nature, anything that's been causing you to seek your own needs before everything else, Man, that's the flesh. We all have it, and we've all struggled with it, and probably still do on a certain level. But for those who are unsaved, they are completely captive to it, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, it says. The body is the same word for the flesh used earlier that we just talked about, but the mind is that faculty of reason, even our way of thinking. The way we reason things out is tainted with the selfishness of the flesh. So another question, is the flesh still a driving influence on your life? Would you say that in your life you're you're living and making decisions and your behaviors and attitudes are driven by that inner flesh or is it being driven by the Spirit of God? Well, and we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. By nature, children of wrath. You know, that idea of nature 
has to do with your origin. It has to do with uh, where you came from. Um, animals have a nature, a different nature than us. And again, I mean, they're cute and they're cuddly. Just like babies, right? They're cute and they're cuddly, but animals have a nature that is in line with the animal part of who they are. Like my, my dog. And if you have a dog, you know just how disgusting dogs can be. <laughs> they are cute and cuddly, and then they turn around and they do something, and you're like, they just licked me with that tongue, you know? <laughs> I always joke around that if it stinks really bad and it's super gross, then my dog finds it appetizing, <laughs> you know? Our fallen nature is kind of like that. Our depravity was not just a result of outside influences. It came from deep within our own fallen nature. And some people like to say, you know, well, we're all children of God. Well, yeah, God created us, but it doesn't say that here. It says we're born by nature children of wrath. And so we're, we come from a different origin. Like Jesus told the Pharisees who were unsaved and judgmental uh, in John 8, 44, it says, you are of your father, the devil. Ouch. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in it. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. And so since we are of this cursed line, we rightfully deserve God's wrath. We're fully responsible for our own sin and deserved hell all on our own, and nobody needed to help us do that. And so the wrath of God is reserved for anyone without Christ, anyone who hasn't been saved by God's grace. And uh, the idea of wrath, I mean, it's really hard for us sometimes to even consider this thought that God is totally loving and merciful and gracious, but he also is wrathful all at the same time. It's not like he turns off his love to show wrath to someone who needs wrath. Um, So this idea of wrath, this word for wrath is God's judgment, which flows from his righteous indignation is poured out on the wicked. Sometimes we forget we were wicked. (laughs) We were evil. We were children of wrath. I like what Aristotle says about the word for wrath here. It's desire with grief. God doesn't just be wrathful and enjoy judging people. It's mixed with grief of God as utter abhorrence to sin, but longing mixed with grief for those who live in it. And so understand God's wrath is real and it will be expressed, but he's done everything everything that he could do to save you from it. After the sixth seal in the book of Revelation, in chapter 6, 15, it says, and the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful, and every slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. Two words you wouldn't expect to go together, right? A gentle lamb (laughs) that is wrathful. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? The lamb has given his life for those who would put their faith in him, yet he will return as judge. Now concerning anyone who receives the mark of the beast, the wrath is also spoken of in Revelation 14, verse nine. In another angel, a third 
followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in its image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. And it's not only the worshipers of the beast, but also the devil and his angels that are sent to that same place. But also anyone without a savior. Why? Because wrath is what we deserved. Like the rest of mankind, we're no better than anybody else. And so verses one through three remind us of our testimony. We're all in the same boat here. We all have a gnarly aspect of our testimony and that is we deserved wrath. But the good news (laughs) is seen in verses four through seven. Now we are gloriously redeemed, gloriously redeemed. But notice verse four, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. After painting the most helpless picture for humanity, Paul says one of the most hopeful phrases you could ever hear, but God. When your situation was desperate, but God. When all seemed lost, but God. When we mess everything up, but God when there's no one else to turn to, but God. The father initiated his plan for your salvation. He saw your helpless state and his compassion was stirred and he stepped forth and offered his own son to die in your place. But God, being rich in mercy, Wrath and mercy, you know, these are two words that are kind of, uh, mercy cancels the wrath. Wrath and mercy are both attributes of God and coexist, but we will experience one or the other. It all has to do with what you do with his son. His mercy is that he does not pour out the wrath we deserve. Instead, he gives us grace. Grace. I love Psalm 103, and I know a lot of you guys do. Maybe you've read this a bunch of times, but after reading about our gnarly past, it's so great to be reminded of God's mercy. Psalm 103, verse eight. The Lord is merciful, amen? And gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, praise God, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers we are dust. Notice how God's love is emphasized here. Not only did he show us mercy, but it was because of the great love with which he loved us. That's how Paul writes it. Because of the great love with which he loved us. His mercy flows from his love. Even when we were dead, he says, and he brings this back. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God loved us in that moment to die for us. Even when you were at your worst, when everybody else in your life would abandon you, when this world would cancel you, when you were at your worst, when you were the most unlovable, God 
loved you and poured out his mercy. Not when you were good enough, but when you were at your worst. In Romans 5, 8, it says, but God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Show me God loves me. Maybe you've heard that before. Well, guess what? It was displayed. It was shown to the universe how much he loved you. And that was when all your sin was piled up in one big heap, all your guilt and shame of everything you've ever thought, done, said, or felt. He perceived it all and chose to die for you. That is his love. So stop trying to be lovable to God because he has already demonstrated his love to you. Instead of trying to earn it, we, we receive it. <laughs> and so there are some Christians that spend a lot of time trying to earn God's love. And, and, and if you're doing that, you're missing the whole point of the gospel. Just receive his great love. And notice in his great love and mercy, he did three things in our lives, just as we saw three influences in our past of the world and Satan in the flesh. Now we have three things that Jesus does in our life. And these things are amazing because he unifies himself with you. It's like he says, you are now mine and I am yours and nothing will ever separate the two of us. From now on, Everything I do, you do. Everywhere I go, you go. Just like Mary's little lamb, you know, everywhere she went. That lamb sure was there, you know. Everywhere our shepherd goes. We are united with him and will never be separated from him. And so the three main verbs of this long sentence, verses 1 through 10, are found here. Made alive together raised us up with him and seated us with him. Notice all three actions Jesus Christ did. He, he was dead and buried, but he was made alive. And then he rose from the grave. And then he ascended into heaven. And so everywhere he has gone, he takes us with him. Our old life has been buried in the grave. But with Christ, we've been made spiritual alive, just as sure as he was made alive when he was in the tomb. And just as sure as he rose from the tomb, and that stone was rolled away, and he emerged victorious. So have we but also just as sure as he is ascended into heaven and is seated at the Father's right hand, so are we. So notice those three things. We're made alive together with him. We were spiritually dead, remember? But now we're made alive. When we believed and obeyed the gospel, our spiritual life was immediate. Just like Adam's spiritual death was immediate when he ate that fruit, when we accepted Christ, boom, you were spiritually made alive in that instant. It was immediate and eternal. And then uh, though Adam died physically, we are promised that we will be raised and live forever. In John 3, 3, Jesus tells us this. Um, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Why do we need to be born again? Because we're spiritually dead. We need a brand new birth. And John says this, um, it records what Jesus says in, in verses six through eight as well. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said this to you. You must be born again. 
The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born in the Spirit. Yesterday, I was watching the wind. It's been kind of windy the last few days. And uh, around us, we have a lot of fir trees. And every time the wind blows, man, we get dead branches falling down and pine cones and all this stuff. We have to clean up the whole yard again, which the good thing about it, though, it means I get to burn stuff again. But uh, the process is not very fun until you get to burn it. Um, But the wind, you know, you, you see its effects, but you don't see the wind. And that's the same thing when you accepted Christ, you were made spiritually alive and and the effects were immediate. There was a transformation, there was a move in your life where people around you saw a change, saw a difference. They couldn't put their finger on it because you can't see it with your eyes, but it's real. The Spirit of God, you were born again. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Praise the Lord. The old is dead and buried and the new has come to life. By grace, we have been saved. We'll look at that more next week as we look at verses eight through 10. But the second word raised us up with Christ. You know, that physical animation follows life. Remember Lazarus when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, you know, Lazarus was made alive again, but what if he didn't come out of the grave and take off the grave clothes? You know, the resurrection, being raised with Christ is important because we step out of the old life and remove the old clothes and we walk in the newness of life. Well, That third idea of being seated with Christ is powerful. It's very powerful. Because earlier we were just talking about how the prince of the power of the air used to rule our life. And and so now on this earth, you, you you might look up and say, well, how can you escape the prince of the power of the air? Well, it's because we were raised with Christ and seated with him in the heavenlies, the heavenly places. Jesus is now ruling From the Father's right hand in heaven, he has been seated in a position of authority, but we are with him positionally right now. And why is that so important? Well, because that means we are lifted higher than the prince of the power of the air. We're seated with Jesus who conquered the enemy. We are presently exalted with him. We, we now have privileges and honor and authority all because we've been united with him. He always keeps us with him and we keep him with us. We're seated above every evil spiritual ruler and authority. And so we as Christians should no longer be afraid of the enemy. If you are experiencing some sort of spiritual oppression. Oftentimes, the solution is proclaiming Christ's victory. There was a time in my youth when I can say I experienced some evil spiritual oppression. And it would happen at night And, you know, not only was it seeing things and hearing things and experiencing some sleep paralysis and stuff, but in crazy dreams, but one day I learned to proclaim Christ's victory. And so I woke up from this crazy situation saying in the name of Jesus, get out of my house. And never again, never again, did I see anything, hear anything, or experience those dark forces. You know, God is powerful. We're seated with him above everything. Don't let the enemy scare you or trick you into thinking you are his prey. Well, 
This is now our eternal position, victory in Christ. This is now our forever home. We will always be with him. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our identity is in Christ. And then verse seven ends. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Forever, we are going to be in amazement at what God has done in our lives. Forever. It will learn in chapter three, and I think Grant's teaching this passage, that God uses our testimony as a lesson to all the angels and especially the fallen ones to teach them about how gracious God is, how merciful God is, how loving God is, that he would be glorified by forgiving you and dying for you. But this story will be told forever and never forgotten When Jesus rose from the dead, the mark on his side and his hands and his feet were all there. He could have just went, boop, you know, brand new body, all the marks gone, but why did he leave them? As a continual testimony to remind us of his love and his kindness. It's going to take eternity to plumb the depths of his love. It's going to take eternity to grasp his mercy and grace. In Ephesians 14, that's why Paul prays this, for this reason I bow my knee before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. What is he praying that we're strengthened to perceive? Well, it's so that you may dwell, or so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of God. And so we will always be plumbing those depths, the eternal, infinite love of God. And so this is your testimony. This is your story. If you've ever thought it was boring, eh, wrong, Your testimony is powerful and it gives glory to God because that's what a testimony is for, to tell everybody what God has done. So now this is your testimony too. And I want to just close with this. I want to read this passage again in the first person. It's not just we, but if you've put your faith in Christ, it's you. And so maybe you can even read it with me. And I I put it in first person, so this is not exactly the way Scripture is, just in case you didn't know. All right, here we go. Read along with me. And I was dead in the trespasses and sin in which I once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom I once lived in the passions of my flesh, carrying out the desires of body and mind and was by nature a child of wrath like the rest of mankind. Never forget your past, but (laughs) never forget what God has done. And it goes on, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved me, even when I was dead in my trespasses, made me alive together with Christ By grace, I have been saved and raised me up with him and seated me with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards me in Christ Jesus. Amen. And that is now your testimony. Never forget it. If you've been here today and and you're thinking, you know, well, that first part of the fallen person is is where I'm at. I'm still under the power of the evil one. I'm, I'm still a slave to sin. I still need a savior. If that's where you're at today, I wanna 
encourage you to receive Christ. And I want to pray this prayer as we close. And perhaps today is the day. If you're hearing God, think about what a miracle that is. Your eyes were once blinded, but he's opened them now so you can hear and understand the gospel. Don't ignore it. Respond in faith. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your mercy and your love that you sent your son for me to die on the cross. I thank you for paying the price, for pouring out your blood to pay for my sin. And so Jesus, I receive your gift of eternal life and call on your name, Jesus Christ, Son of God, save me, a sinner. I give my whole life to you, Lord, and I thank you that you have now made me alive. You've raised me up and you've seated me with you in the heavenlies. And so I give you all that I am and pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.